Oh, there you are. You have a Bible. Uh, yeah, what happened to you? Bad habits. Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening your eyes. It's going to open your eyes. You're going to know exactly where you're at, what you have to say, what you have to think, what you have to do, even where to go for you to be safe. So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, noten veshomerek varech, lelamed liedrikhut leyanohat otanu, bederech sheba aleinu lelechet, aledet perhat aneinu uzaninu vilevno. למען תמסור לנו מרחמתך יד יתרה ודבונתך, ונראה נפלאות מתורתך. שרוע הקודש שלך תנחה את קולנו אל כל האמת, ברך את לימוד המילה אליך בשם ישוע. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the Universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way that we should go by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding that we may all behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 I want you to turn to Psalm 19 and verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Look at verse 8. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. What's a statute? Generally speaking, statutes are written statements. These can be collected together in one place orally or maybe even in a book. Statutes are written action statements, meaning that they carry with them orders to be followed. These are what we call commandments. Now to command somebody or to give a commandment, it means to bid, to order, to direct, particular direction, to charge, imply authority, to require obedience to the commandment that is actually written. A statute is a formal set of laws or rules. Whether it's enacted by a government, company, or other organization, a statute is typically written down. Local governments can pass all kinds of statutes or written laws to govern their citizens with. So a statute, quote unquote, is a formal written law or regulation enacted by an authority. And in this case, God, coming from the scriptures, often used to emphasize the binding and legal nature of a directive or command to be followed. As the term statute and commandment can sometimes overlap in meaning and sometimes they're also used interchangeably. And it was very, very hard to distinguish what a statute and what a commandment was. It's like the words transgression, iniquity, and sins. These are three different words. And I found one verse in the Bible where all three words are used in the same sentence. So don't come and tell me it's sin, sin, sin. So the word statute and commandment, people use it interchangeably. However, in a biblical context, there are subtle differences between these two words. A statute is a set of written statements, while those statements themselves are the commandments. You've got the books with everything written, with all the categories, with all the topics. Once you open these categories and topics, all of a sudden now you're getting into the specific statements. Those are the commandments. This is the statute of God. When I start reading verse and a verse and a verse and another verse, those are the commandments. So in the context of the Bible, statutes refer to action statements written down by God, of course using his writers, to his people for their physical, moral, and spiritual guidance. That's why he gave us the statutes. That's why we have the Word of God. Now these action statements become the commandments we are to follow. Statutes incorporate a broader range of laws and regulations. Example, you have the moral laws. So you got the moral law, which is the topic, but then you got so many commandments attached to this particular topic. Ceremonial laws, dietary laws, how about civil laws, sacrificial laws, laws of purity and morality. So you've got those laws over there. Civil governance, just to name a few. They are to govern various aspects of religious, moral, and civil life. Statutes encompass a wide range of rules and guidelines that were given to the Israelites as part of their covenant with God. Here's a few examples. Moral laws. Don't forget, the Bible is a collection of books, and you've got poetry in there, you've got songs in there, you've got history in there, and of course you're going to have your laws by which we're supposed to be basing our lives on. So now you have the moral laws. These laws provide guidance on ethical behavior and personal conduct. 
The Ten Commandments, for example, found in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 are perhaps the most well-known of the moral laws. They cover principles like worshiping God and treating your neighbors well enough, like not stealing from them or not murdering them. Also honorings, one parents, and so on. How about ceremonial laws? These laws govern religious rituals, sacrifices, and ceremonies in ancient Israel. They include instructions for the priesthood, details about the tabernacle, and later on, the temple. They all had the rules and regulations for the various religious festivals and offerings. Example, Passover, Yom Kippur, and the offerings of animals and grain. How about dietary laws? This is the topic, but then you break down into the specific commandments. So the dietary laws, as outlined in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14, specify which animals are clean, permissible to eat, and unclean, forbidden to eat. For the Israelites, these laws also relate to food preparation and restrictions on mixing certain foods. How about laws on purity and impurity? So these laws found in Leviticus and Numbers detail various circumstances and conditions that could render a person or an object ritually impure. They also outline procedures for purification and for cleansing. So it's going to give you a guideline and what for you to follow. How about civil laws? These laws address matters related to civil governance, social justice, and property rights. They divide guidelines for resolving disputes, criminal justice, and fair treatment of individuals within the community. Examples include laws about restitution for theft, regulations on property and inheritance. How about the laws of holiness? God also instituted that in the statute, and we have His commandments. Leviticus chapter 17 through 26 contains a set of laws known as the Holiness Code, which emphasizes personal and societal holiness. They cover topics like honoring parents, caring for the poor, avoiding idolatry, and practicing justice and kindness. How about the Sabbath laws? These laws pertain to the observance of the Sabbath day as the day of rest and worship. They are outlined in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 and other various passages and everything that incorporates on the Sabbath laws. Laws concerning vows and oaths when you make promises. These laws provide guidance on making and fulfilling vows and oaths. They emphasize the importance of keeping one's word and honoring commitments, which today, the word that comes out of somebody's mouth doesn't mean anything anymore. Personally, I've lost faith in a lot of people when they say stuff, especially coming from some of the Christians sometimes. How about the laws of tithing? Is tithing for today? Was tithing just for Israel? How does that work? That's another Bible study. I'm just going to cover the topical. Tithing laws require the giving of a portion of one's income or produce to support the priesthood, the orphans, the widows, and the maintenance of the religious infrastructure which was given to Israel. The statutes of the Lord are right. This means that within the statutes of the Lord, God's rules and commandments are just and they're morally right. You can never go wrong. You can be on that path with the lights closed and you're never going to trip. You're never going to fall into the hole. They guide us and help us make good and righteous choices, which a lot of people today are not making. Why? Remember when I talked about the godly wisdom and then the worldly wisdom? Whatever you're standing on, that's where your life is going to be going. Live a clean life without getting tangled in the different evils that we can get ourselves into. But if you're standing on the statutes of God and understanding what the commandments are in whatever area of your life, that's what's going to keep your head on your shoulders and your feet on the ground. You cannot go wrong. There's nobody that's going to move you off of that. The statutes of the Lord are right. They help to keep us safe from Satan, from evil men with mischievous intentions from the evil woman that would lure you into sexual depravities, draining your life out of you. Since I'm here, let me give you an example. Let's take a look at Proverbs chapter 7. We'll start reading in verse 7. And beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot, prostitute, and subtle of heart, very wise, very crafty. Now this reminds me of an old song called Devil Woman from Cliff Richards. Here's part of the lyrics. She's just a devil woman with evil on her mind. Beware the devil woman, she's going to get you. I drank the potion she offered me. I found myself on the floor. Then I looked in those big green eyes and I wondered what I came here for. 
If you're out on the moonlit night, be careful of the neighborhood strays of a lady with long black hair trying to wing you with her feminine ways. She's just a devil woman with evil on her mind. Beware of the devil woman, she's gonna get you from behind. As Cliff Richards is warning you of the devil woman, remember God through Solomon 3,000 years ago gave you the same warning of the same type of woman. There's nothing new under the sun, right? So as they were devil women 3,000 years ago, they survived until now, and I got news for you, they're gonna keep surviving. So message to you young men, what are you looking at? What are you getting sucked into? She is going to drain the life out of you. I do not want you to go through that experience, but if you gotta go through that experience, after you get out of it from the other side, looking all scumbopulated, you turn around and you're gonna warn the next young man to say, hey, don't go there because I've been there and this is what happened to me. And they say that the Bible is an outdated book. Right, blow it out your ear. Verse 11, she is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now she is without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. What is she waiting for? So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me this day, and I have paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligent to seek thy face, and I have found thee, poor sucker. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. For the good man is not at home. My husband is not at home. The good man is not at home. He is gone on a long journey. He hath taken a a bag of money with him and will come home at the day appointed. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Let me say it another way. As a dog is enticed by food to the chain that's going to be holding him back, so does the youth go to the temptress, to the harlot, to the prostitute in the middle of the deep dark night. Why dark? Nobody sees what's happening and that's where a lot of bad things happen. Verse 23, till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasted to the snare, to the trap, and knoweth not that it is for his life. He doesn't know that she's coming for his soul. Those who recognize this light, what I just finished reading, what God is trying to bring to the world, this wisdom, this help, this guidance, this protection found within the statutes of the Lord will in the end rejoice in the heart of the man that's going to keep this, hide it in his heart and walk on that narrow path. This is the man who follows hard after the Lord and says, Lord, show me your statutes, show me your commandments, I want to walk in it. I'm going to give you another example. We're talking about the statutes, which are the bigger topics. Now I'm going into the specifics, which are the commandments. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 20. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart. That means never forget about them and tie them about thy neck. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. And when thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. It's going to keep you safe. When thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. It's going to guide you and it's going to give you good advice. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instructions are the way of life. Look at verse 24. To keep thee from the evil woman, the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. When a woman is dressed and clad the way that she is, revealing everything, no more to the imagination, you start salivating, she just hooked you. You guys, you want a good solid woman that fears the Lord, these women, they're covered. Verse 26, for by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Once she gets you, you're fried, you're cooked. I'll see you later, alligator, if there's gonna be anything left of you. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Uh, no. Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Uh, no. You mess with this type of a woman, you are definitely going to get burnt. As Elvis once sang, you're looking for trouble? <laughs> you came to the right place. Go mess with a whore, with a prostitute. It's going to drain you. That's what you want in life. For five seconds of pleasure, think before doing it. So he that goeth into his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her, carnally speaking, sexually speaking, shall not be innocent. You're going to be guilty. The man, woman, or child that follows God's commandments will bring with it 
inner peace. This is what everybody's looking for. You don't have inner peace? Start looking into the scriptures. And you pray and say, hey Lord, before you open that book, I want you to talk to me. Lord, I want this inner peace, a peace which passes all understanding. I've had that peace. Believe me, it's mind-blowing. It's like I'm already in heaven when I'm not there yet. A peace which passes all understanding means I cannot explain it. And it's like I want to live here forever. And this is going to be part of heaven. So it's going to bring inner peace, happiness, and contentment. When you will live according to His principles, you will experience a sense of joy and fulfillment. In the context of the Bible, statutes often refer to the laws and commandments given by God to His people for a moral and spiritual guidance, for their safety and for their protection. Not because God has nothing to do in heaven and He just wants to put these commandments on your shoulders so you're going to be walking through life on your knees. That's not it. If somebody put that into your head, you were brainwashed by these people. And when troubles come, many times God wants to show you at what level you're at in your walk with Him. Take the United States for example right now. They have statutes that are worthless. A friend of mine from Pennsylvania said that people now have been going into stores and they're allowed to steal up to a thousand dollars and they cannot get charged. And there's nothing that anybody can do to actually stop them. When a country loses the power of the law that they set in place for the safety and protection of their citizens where their statutes basically is worthless, there's no rejoicing of the heart. Like we just finished reading, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The law that God gave us, they are right, and these are going to rejoice us because we know that there's justice, there's love, there's peace, there's joy, there, there's happiness in there, there's harmony in there. It's there for our good. But if this law that I'm walking on, that I'm standing on, and all of a sudden, it basically is going to be shot to hell, what am I doing? I'm going to stop going to church and I'm just going to pick up golf, which I hate. So like I was saying, there's no rejoicing of the heart. Rather, there is fear and apprehension. As the very foundation of trust and security begins to crumble, people are just going to start shying away. But God's Word is eternal. I already gave that back a couple of weeks ago. How God's Word is settled in heaven. How God's Word is going to be eternal. When you have a good foundational structure in the statutes that are written for you to follow or for you to stand on, you are better equipped to navigate your life with wisdom, with integrity, and a sense of purpose. This is what's going to rejoice your heart. So Psalm 19.8, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The commandment. A commandment is a specific directive or order issued by an authority found within the statutes. Commandments found within the statutes are typically more specific and direct in their instructions. They often emphasize moral, ethical, and religious obligations. The word command means to bid, to order, to direct, to charge, implying authority, power to control, and it requires obedience. A command is a mandate, an order or injunction given by authority, and it's an order for us to follow. A commandment, quote unquote, is a specific instruction or directive given by God within the framework of statutes. Example, we're talking about the moral code before. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not kill. That's in verse 13. Verse 14, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Verse 15, Thou shalt not steal. These are specific commandments now. So commandments are often precise statements that convey particular obligations or prohibitions. These commandments are there to help us, guide us, and keep us safe and protected from life hammers that keep hitting us in back of the head. And believe me, there's some days these hammers, they just don't stop. But the Lord is there to give you the directives. You keep on this road and watch what's going to happen to the hammers. These commandments, they highlight specific actions or attitudes that align with God's standards. Commandments are an integral part of the law, serving as practical guidelines for daily living and reflecting God's expectations for His people's behavior. In this context, the word commandment refers to the authoritative directives or instructions given by the Lord to the believer. And in verse 8 it says, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. These commandments are described as pure, signifying their moral and spiritual clarity. Once you know what the commandment is, you know what's going to keep you clean, you know what's going to keep you solidly fixed on the ground without you basically just going haywire and just derail your life. 
They bring enlightenment and understanding to those who follow them, guiding them in righteous living and revealing spiritual truths that enlighten the mind and the heart. By enlightenment, here means bringing knowledge, insight and clarity to those who learn them to choose to follow them. Jesus memorized these two laws in two commandments. In Matthew chapter 22 verse 37, we'll start reading there. And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. You want to summarize the Old Testament? He just did it for you. Love God, love your neighbor, you can't go wrong. Before I mention laws concerning vows and oaths, these laws provide guidance on making and fulfilling vows, oaths, promises. They emphasize the importance of keeping one's word and honoring commitment, which today is something that's disappearing off the face of the earth. That's why I'm having a hard time trusting people. So this is an overall topic contained in the statutes. These statutes incorporate a broad range of laws and commandments like we had seen before, and the specifics are found in the actual commandments themselves. So let me break down a couple of examples for you. To what I can gather, a vow is a promise made directly to God in His presence. And when we promise anything, God is the witness to your pledge or promise. Example, marriage vows. It's a promise that you're making to God's face, but also to the person. But God is your witness. You made a promise, He expects you to keep it. Yeah, but you know, Lord, she's like this or he's like that. No, 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 no. Before you get married, you check out if you guys are actually compatible. If you find that there's red flags, plant them. Says, you know what? Hasta la vista. It was nice talking to you. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to go find myself somebody else. Oh, but they're going to change in time. What are you, nuts? Can a leopard change his spots? Very few are the people that are actually going to change. So a vow is a solemn promise that a person makes to God, either to perform some type of action or behave in a specific manner as witnesses. Example, God, if you do this for me, I'm going to do that for you. There's a lot of those prayers going around. Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 22. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, If God will be with me, so here's the condition, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then, only then, shall the Lord be my God. You do this, I'm going to do this. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So he's making a bargain with God. Another example is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. Story of Anna. And she vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. An oath now is a sworn statement or promise that is made to men. So as we say, I swear to God, you know, I swear to God, where God is the witness to either to do something or to attest that something is true. I swear to God, I'm telling you the truth. So that would be an oath. An oath refers to a declaration or promise that is made in God's presence to another person, speaking horizontally, but God is the witness now. In other words, it's a sworn statement that a person makes to other men, invoking God as a witness that something is actually true. Example, an oath of office when somebody they're sworn in. What about when you're in court? In court you are sworn in or you give your word that you will say the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God because if you're telling me a lie, He's going to come back after you. A false oath is called perjury. In Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips is an abomination to the Lord. An oath refers to the person who swears an oath to perform an action or swears that something is true. The difference between a vow and an oath is an oath is a sworn statement or a promise that is made to men with God as a witness to do something or to attest that something is true. Whereas a vow is a promise to God to perform some type of act or behave in a specific manner with men as witnesses in most cases. Turn with me now to Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. This is what everybody is doing today. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. Better not to say something than to say something, not do it, and then you get in trouble. This verse emphasizes the importance of keeping one's vows and oaths made to the Lord and men. Here you have both the oath and the vow in the same commandment. Whichever comes out of your mouth, make sure that you keep and perform what you said you would do. Turn with me now to Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 4. 
When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Defer not means don't delay, don't put off, don't postpone to a future time. You opened your mouth to promise something, you better produce it now. You don't want to do it? Keep your mouth shut. As a believer, you cannot go wrong. There's going to be no drama in your life. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33? Again, ye have heard, it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. Jesus is addressing the issue of oaths and making a point about truthfulness and honesty in one's speech. When you give a word and you don't keep it, can somebody trust you? Absolutely not. I, for one, usually take three steps backward. Hey, hi, how you doing? But I want nothing to do with you. In the Old Testament, it was common practice for people to make oaths invoking the name of the Lord or a divine witness to emphasize the truthfulness of their statements or commitments. Just like today, who swear on almost anything. Swear to God. They swear on their mother's heads. They swear on their kids' heads. They swear on their father's heads. Some of them, they swear on their dog's head. I never understood that one. And whatever else that these people can conjure up. The commandment, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths, that we just finished reading, reflects the importance of keeping one's oaths, your word, and commitments to God. It emphasizes that if you make an oath to the Lord, you should fulfill it and not break your word. However, Jesus goes further in the following verses to provide a deeper teaching on this matter. Verse 34, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, neither by earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black. What are you doing swearing on your mother's head and your kid's head? But let your communications be yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh evil. The fact of you breaking your word and not performing it is evil in the sight of the Lord. In these verses, Jesus encourages a simpler and more honest approach to your speech towards others. He advises against making unnecessary oaths and promises and emphasizes that one's word should be trustworthy and truthful without the need for God to be a witness. Essentially, our everyday communication should be characterized by straightforward honesty. So there is no need of additional oaths to validate our statements. Think about that. If you have to say, I swear to God, are you in the habit of lying? Uh, no? Okay, good. So why do you have to swear to God? Just give me your honest word and I will trust you. If people can't take your word at face value, change your communication and behavior to build trust and credibility with people through constant honesty, which is something that seems to be disappearing from off the face of the earth, and integrity. In summary, Jesus expands on this teaching to emphasize the importance of truthful and honest speech, discouraging unnecessary oaths, and emphasizing the value of straight forward communication. In this passage that Jesus spoke in Matthew 5, Jesus instructs the believers now, you call yourself by the name of the Lord, so he's talking to you. Do not make unnecessary oaths, but let your yes be yes and mean it, and let your no be no and mean it. And this is going to indicate the importance of your truthful and honest speech. And eventually, you will have a reputation. These verses and passages highlight the significance of keeping vows and oaths made to God and the importance of honesty and integrity in one's speech and commitments. How many commitments are broken? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. And the guy's still waiting. Here are some commandments that emphasizes the importance of honesty and truthfulness. Let's look at the first one. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 22. Lying lips is an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. This verse highlights that God values truthfulness and honesty while abhorring lies. Do you know what it means? An abomination means extreme hatred. He's got an extreme hatred for lying. As much as possible, I took that out of my mouth. And if I'm about to do something where I have to lie, I'd rather not do it. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. This is talking about the believers to the believers. That means believers were lying to other believers. The world is already doing it, 
and now this has crept into the church? We're talking about 2,000 years ago. In this New Testament verse, it encourages believers to speak the truth and avoid falsehood with their uninteractions with others. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 11. Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. This verse emphasizes the prohibition of lying and dealing falsely with one another. What does Colossians 3.9 say? Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. Your old world, your old life. People lie in the world. But now that you've got the Holy Spirit that's actually sealed within you, stop lying. In this passage, believers are admonished not to lie to each other as they put off their old ways. Put on the new way. Stop lying. Why is it so hard? Why are you lying in the first place? What's the motive? What are you trying to hide? What does Zechariah have to say? Turn to chapter 8 and verse 16. These are the things that ye shall do. Commandment. Speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. This verse encourages speaking the truth to one's neighbor and promoting justice, truth, and peace. Go to Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 1. Better is the poor that walketh in his integrity than he that is perverse in his lips and is a fool. This verse contrasts walking in integrity and being perverse in speech, emphasizing the value of honesty. You've heard the old saying, honesty is the best policy. There's a lot of experience. There's years and years and years behind that proverb. It's there for you for your guidance, if you're willing to take this wisdom and to actually walk with it. These verses highlight the significance of honesty and truthfulness as important virtues in the biblical text. They encourage individuals to speak the truth, avoid falsehood, and live with integrity in their interactions with other people. In essence, a commandment is found within a statute and it often carries with it a strong moral and ethical connotation. Statutes cover a wider range of regulations and laws. The key difference is in the specificity of the directness of the instruction. Commandments are more focused and they're more direct, while statutes can be more comprehensive and cover a variety or various aspects of the law and governance. One last example, the laws of cleanliness. You'll find this in Leviticus chapters 12 and 15. God gives statutes regarding issues of cleanliness and purification, including guidelines for childbirth, skin disease, and bodily discharges. Just one example. Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 16. If any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash his flesh in water and be unclean until the even. And every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the even. You know what the seed of copulation is? Obviously. Uh, well, if you don't know what it is, it's basically once you've been with a woman, it's time to clean up after yourself. Because there must be something in that bodily discharge that might make you unclean. The statute that has to do with the laws of cleanliness. This is one particular one that I just happened to pull out. This is the one that came to my mind. After you finished, you take a shower. The statutes incorporates all the laws of cleanliness and the verse in Leviticus chapter 15 verse 16, 17 is an example of that particular command. These statutes are considered to be righteous and just and they bring joy and gladness to the heart of those who follow them. You will not get sick. That's why you're going to go out and wash yourself. Would you rather be sick at a doctor's office or be clean at home with a smile on your face? They are divine guidelines for living a righteous and fulfilling life according to God's will. His will is for our benefit, if you haven't figured it out yet. A statute is an overall formal written law or regulation enacted by an authority, God, a commandment is a specific directive or order issued by an authority found within the statutes. Last but not least, in Psalm 19.8, The statutes of the Lord are right. There's nothing wrong in them. Rejoicing the heart by you following everything that God's given you. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening your eyes. It's going to open your eyes. You're going to know exactly where you're at, what you have to say, what you have to think, what you have to do, even where to go for you to be safe. So guys, have yourselves a good week. Lord willing, we'll see each other next week. May the Lord keep you, guide you. 
So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, there is none righteous, no not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on His name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16.31 Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.